Hello again, Jules fans. Welcome back to the latest episode of Jules in the Blood TV. It is Saturday the 31st of July. We are now only seven days away from the Skybet League One resuming. Next Saturday, the 7th of August, everything gets underway. We cannot wait. I'm sure you cannot wait. Was back at the friendly for the Jules against Millwall on Tuesday evening. Back in a stadium for the first time in over 500 days. Was absolutely brilliant. Jules put in a really good performance in that one-all draw with the Londoners. And yeah, just another sense of normality and excitement now really building ahead of the new season. Today's video is, of course, my season preview. First of all, I'll be looking at the Jules in more detail. Going to break it down into sections. We're going to look at top scorer for the coming campaign. We're going to look at who's going to have a breakthrough season. We're going to have a look at a youngster to make an impact. Look at the transfer business so far from Steve Evans and Paul Rayner. And then uh, the big question, where will the Jules finish come the end of the campaign? And then after that, we'll be looking at League One as a whole. Who will be celebrating as champions? Who will be going up as runners-up? Who will be battling the playoffs? Who will succumb to the dreaded drop? And every team in between. Right, let's get straight into it with the Jills. Top scorer prediction for 21-22. It might be slightly boring, might be slightly predictable, but I'm going to go for the big man for Dane Oliver again. 17 goals in League One last season. Three more in the cup competitions gave him 20 overall. He was a huge reason why Steve Evans' men briefly flirted with the top six. We went in there, didn't we, on uh, the Wednesday before Easter with a 1-0 win over Wigan. We'd obviously played a couple of games extra. But it was nice to be talking about the top six and not looking over our shoulders, not worrying about the bottom four. And for Dane Oliver was superb. His goal certainly played a big part along with Jordan Grahams and all his assists as well. A little bit more pressure on Verdane this season currently. We only have John Akindi as an alternative and they're pretty much the same player in terms of their abilities and their skill set. But yeah, I'm going to back as it stands for Dane Oliver to be the Jules top scorer in 21-22. If he gets anywhere near that 17 goals that he got last time out, then I think we're in for another good campaign. The player to make the breakthrough season is going to be someone that arrived in the summer. Um, he's 29 years of age, so it might be a bit strange me saying that he's going to have a breakthrough season. But I'm looking at it in terms of what he can do in League One. He's a player that I'm very interested to see live. Uh, we had a look at him up top on Tuesday night against Millwall in the one-all draw in that friendly. And that's Danny Lloyd. The last time he played at this level uh, in 2017-18, he contributed eight goals and four assists for Peterborough under Steve Evans for a while. Then dropped down into the National League. Played League Two last season with Tramio and helped them get into the playoffs. So it's going to be interesting to see how he steps back up. Early signs for me are really promising. Technically, he looks very good. He's got two good feet. He works really hard out of possession. I think that's a given in any Steve Evans and Paul Rayner side. It looks like he can play from either side. Potentially could play in the 10 or as a centre forward. That's where he started on Tuesday night. We played a diamond and he was up front alongside the Dane Oliver. Not sure if that was out of necessity because we don't have a different type of striker to Oliver and Akindi. But for me, the player I'm most interested to see and have a breakthrough campaign at League One level is Danny Lloyd. Next category is youngster to have a positive impact throughout the campaign. And we've got a few candidates here. I think young um, Harvey Lintock can play right back or centre half was very decent against Millwall when he came on on Tuesday evening. He could be one that we turn to, especially if we pick up a couple of injuries or suspensions, because we might not be running with a big squad. Uh, Daniel Phillips is coming on loan for the season from Watford in the Premier League. Was very good again Tuesday night against Millwall. Played at the base of a diamond and excelled. Wasn't quite as good in his first game against Colchester, but I'm going to put that down to perhaps being a little bit over-eager. We've got young Gerald Satole. Made his debut in the first team coming on against Northampton towards the back end of last season. He he could be um, one to keep an eye on, but he's been suffering from an ankle knock in pre-season. But my pick is the goalkeeper that's arrived from Premier League Giants, Chelsea. Kept 17 league clean sheets last season for Stevenage as they improve throughout the campaign. I think they're an outside bet for promotion this season at that level. Therefore, my player to have a positive impact is goalkeeper Jamie Cumming. I think he looks a really good signing. We've only seen him for an hour so far, but looking at his statistics from last season, all the Stevenage fans' feedback was really good. Chelsea clearly think uh, a lot of him. So my youngster to have a positive impact is going to be goalkeeper Jamie Cumming. Let's have a look at the transfer business so far for the Jules. Manager Steve Evans, his assistant Paul Rayner and chairman Paul Scally have been working very hard throughout the campaign to add to the squad. We released quite a few at the back end of last season, the likes of Sasha Bastien, Matty Willock, Dominic Samuel. The big three, probably, though, that we lost 
uh, those that turned down the offer of new contracts were Jordan Graham, who's now going to be plying his trade in the Championship with Birmingham City and well-deserved too. Jack Bonham has also stepped up to the second tier. He has joined Stoke on a free transfer and is going to compete to be number one up there. And the third one, the slightly weird one, is our trialist. Connor Ogilvy turned down new terms at the back end of last campaign, but since played twice for us in friendlies against Colchester and Millwall. Got 90 minutes, I think it was, at Cole U, and he played the first half against Millwall Tuesday evening. Steve Evans has confirmed that that deal is still on the table for Connor Ogilvy, and with a week to go, who knows what's going to happen. If we get him back in, it certainly represents a big coup and would fill the gap that we need to plug at the left-back area. We've only got David Tutonda there at the moment, and he barely featured... Uh, because of COVID. So they're the three big names that have left, but one may came back. In terms of players coming in, there's been some really good ones. Aaron Chapman and Jamie Cumming are the two goalkeepers now. I think it's great. It's really refreshing that we're going to have two keepers. Genuinely could be number one. Um, Cumming, I've already mentioned, as a youngster to have a really positive impact this season, was very good at Stevenage last term. And Aaron Chapman lost his way a little bit in the last couple of seasons, but you have to remember he's played under Steve Evans previously for Peterborough, and he was very, very good in Accrington's title-winning season in League 2 not so long ago. Most recently been at Motherwell. And what I've seen of him so far, he was very solid against Colchester, made some really good saves. I know he came on for the last half hour against the Lions on Tuesday. He did concede, but it wasn't uh, anything he could do about the goal, and he did make a couple of big saves in that game as well so really good that we've got two keepers on the books who could invariably be number one uh, looking further ahead we've saw Reese Bennett as a centre back slash right back that's where he's featured in the two friendly so far I've been super impressed with him another former Steve Evans starlet uh, 29 years of age plenty of experience at the top end of this division and what I've seen of him so far he looks versatile he's comfortable on the ball he's not without pace he's not the quickest but he's certainly no slouch and I think that's going to be a very astute piece of business we'll give competition to to Jack Tucker and another new signing that I'll mention in a minute will certainly provide cover at right back like he did on Tuesday night um yeah, so that brings me on to Max Amar has returned after a year away at Bristol Rovers where they got relegated, taking absolutely no notice of that. He stepped back into the breach on Tuesday evening and was absolutely immaculate against Millwall. One clearance first half was unreal. Uh, looked like a Benicophobe volley was going into the top corner until Max intervened, uh, stretching high to deflect the ball round at post for a corner. So that's another really good signing and that's the player that will provide competition for Jack Tucker, Reese Bennett. Robbie McKenzie will probably fill in there. And dare I say, Conor Ogilvy, if he does re-sign on the dotted line. Next up is David Totonda. I've already mentioned another from Bristol Rovers. Steve Evans has said that he's been interested in him for a couple of years. Finally got his man in the summer. Um, don't know a lot about him. Know he's out and out quick. That was what Ryan, the Bristol Rovers fan, told us a couple of weeks ago on a video. Um, but unfortunately, he's only had about 45 minutes of football because of having COVID. I know he's back and available now. So it'd be interesting if we see him um, in the friendlies that we do have left before we get underway against Lincoln next Saturday. Uh, middle of the park. Daniel Phillips, highly regarded by Watford, it seems. A lot of their fans said he's a good player. Um, and he did show it against Millwall on Tuesday evening. He's a, he's a big lad for his age. He's only a teenager. He gets about the part really well. Doesn't mind a tackle. I think he picked up a yellow card on his debut against Colchester. So bookings in friendlies are not the norm. So that shows you how he plays the game. Um, I'm sure someone like Stuart O'Keefe will certainly take him under his wing because I'm sure he likes that type of player. Um, and yeah, he certainly adds to the options. If we play a diamond, he can play at the base. And if we play a 4-2-3-1, I'm sure he can be used as a, as a double pivot in front of the back four. Um, Next up is Ben Reeves, technically very good. Got a wand of a left foot, Jonathan Harry's the MK Dons fan told us recently. And uh, he's been very decent in pre-season from what I've seen. Uh, provided an assist against Welling for John Akindi to equalise late on. Scored the opener against Colchester last week. And then we watched him in the flesh against Millwall. Works really hard out of possession. Um, played from the left-hand side of a diamond. Think he can play wide left if we played a 4-2-3-1. So gives us versatility and a couple of options. And yeah, I really like that signing at the moment from what I've seen. Probably come in slightly under the radar like Alex McDonald did last year. Um, last couple are Oliver Lee has returned on a permanent. We've had him on um, loan the last two seasons. We had him for the back half of 2021 and we had him for a full season in 1920. So clearly a player that Steve Evans likes, clearly a player that we know all about. Um, he's very good in terms of goals and assists over the last two years. And if he can replicate that form, he's a very, very good player at this level. And of course, the player that I've already mentioned, the one that I said is going to have a breakthrough season, that's Danny Lloyd. Um, 29, provides experience. Looks like he can play two, maybe three positions at a push. 
Um, I'm sure he'll create loads of chances if allowed time on the ball. He'll chip in with a few himself as well. So yeah, that's our business so far at the moment. There's a few gone out. There's plenty come in. Uh, we're probably still three or four away, I would have thought. The good thing is we've only used two loan spaces so, so, far, so far. So we've got three um, available spots in terms of loan deals. But I do prefer permanents because then they're your player. You can't have them called back in January. Uh, but yeah, so far, so good, I would put it down as. And uh, very pleasing transfer window as um, as it stands. The big question, of course, is where do I think Steve Evans Gillingham will end up come at the end of the season? Everybody's doing their 1 to 24s at the moment. 4 4 2 have got theirs out. D3, D4 have produced excellent podcasts. James has written a team profile for every side in League One and League Two. Go and check them out. They're an excellent podcast. Third tier that I co host with Tom and Graham will be out Monday night where we go through our 1 to 24s. Gabe Sutton's written excellent stuff. There's loads of really, really good lower league content out there. So go and check them all out. But in terms of the Jills, based on who we've lost, who we've bought in, but more who we've kept, I am going to back us to finish 10th again. We finished 10th in two seasons in a row under Steve Evans. I know we was 11th, 19, 20, but we got moved up a place because of points per game. We then matched that last season over a full campaign and I'm going to back us to finish 10th again. So many good teams in this division in there. I think there's nearly 50% of the league have played in the Premier League. That's how exciting this campaign is going to be. For me, it could be the best League One season ever. It could be the most competitive division of the four in England. And I really just can't wait for it to get going. Um, obviously want Jules to do well. Would love us to push on and have a real crack at the top six. But have to be realistic at the moment. And uh, there's some huge clubs in this division. But yeah, I'm confident we can match last season's finish at 10th place. Obviously, we still need to do more in the transfer window. But the biggest thing for me is we've got plenty uh, of the team that started last season and played a real part in us finishing in the top 10 and having a little flirt with the playoffs. We've got the likes of Ryan Jackson, Jack Tucker. Max Amor comes in and played a full seven at season under Steve Evans already. Further forward, Stuart O'Keefe will be ready from the off after missing most of last year because of a broken leg. Carl Dempsey, Oliver Lee, for Dane Oliver, Alex McDonald. That's seven or eight that started plenty of games in the second half of last season. In terms of the transfer window, again, I think we've been clever. We've bought more experience and more know-how. What I would criticise Steve Evans and Paul Rainer over their two years in charge is that we've been a little bit slow out the blocks, especially last season where we was very young, lacked a bit of know-how and a little bit of noose, and it left us playing catch-up. And ultimately, that's probably why we didn't get in the playoffs. But this season, we certainly look a little bit stronger and more experienced in terms of who we brought in. Aaron Chapman, 31, no aid for a keeper, but has loads of games under his belt. Uh, Max Amar, Reese Bennett provide experience to help out Jack Tucker, who is still very young. Uh, the likes of O'Keefe and Dempsey in the middle of the park have been supplemented with the additions of, of Reeves and Lee. Danny Lloyd comes in, probably got a point to prove still at this level, but 29 years of age. Up top, we've got two experienced, big, strong target men. And if we can just add to that, if we can add a left back, if we can add a pacey forward and maybe another winger, then I think we're going to be in really good shape. But for me, 10th place for the Jills. Now on to the final section, which is probably the hardest of the whole video, and that's looking at League One as a whole. Normally, I just do top six and bottom four and then leave a graphic of the table up, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail this year. So we'll break it down into four sections and do it in reverse order. So we're going to have a look at um, the bottom six, then the six up, then seventh to twelfth, and then the top six uh, in reverse order. So let's get straight into it. Also need to mention that this is probably the toughest league one to predict in, in what feels like forever. I've already said it could be the most exciting league out of the four in England this year. Um, and there's probably loads of flexibility. So if I've got a team 13th, chances are you could probably move three or four places down or up because such is the quality in the division now. But we're going to give it a go like everyone else. So we're going to start from 19th down to 24th. Uh, in reverse order, bottom of the league, I'm really sorry. It's their first appearance in League One since 2002, I believe. But they have lost their star man, Paul Mullin, who contributed over 30 goals last season. He's dropped into the National League to Wrexham. Make of that what you will, Cambridge fans. But unfortunately, I don't see enough quality to see you staying up. So for that reason, I've got Cambridge United bottom. In 23rd, I've got a team that I back to go down every season and they somehow find a way. They're like Houdini. They have managed to get themselves out of trouble. Always seem to be cut adrift and then put an excellent run together at the end of the season to stay up. But they've lost Joe Piggott this year. His goals were absolutely crucial. I think he accounted for about 40% of their goals over the last couple of seasons. So for that reason, in 23rd, I've gone for Wimbledon. One place above them in 22nd is a team that got to the playoffs two seasons ago under Joey Barton. But that team's been ripped up. They've got no Ched Evans, no Paddy Madden. 
Uh, Wes Burns has left and gone to Fleetwood. What I've seen of the players that they've bought in, they don't feel we were much confidence. I don't see them scoring enough goals, certainly. So my pick for 22nd is Fleetwood. And the final place in the bottom four, and this might be surprising to a few, but they ended last season horrendously. And that was, um, well, I think they were without a win in eight. Uh, Luke Jeffcott was their top scorer. But if you take him out, I don't think they scored loads of goals. They have added some good players, but I think defensively they're very susceptible again. So my final relegation spot goes to Plymouth Argyle. And then the two teams just above them that are going to stay out of trouble by the skin of their teeth. In 20th, I've got Cheltenham Town. They've not done a lot of business in terms of incomings. Just one or two have come in. But they've got Michael Duff in charge. And I think if you've got him, they've got every chance of staying up. I'm sure they're going to bring more players in um, between now and the end of the transfer window. So I think they'll just have enough in 20th. And then in 19th, another promoted side. Um, we had their two directors on the third tier just a few days ago, James and Charlie. They were very bullish. James said they're going to be safe. Charlie was even more optimistic, said 12th. They're certainly not coming into this league to, to just make up the numbers. They've bought in loads of players. Um, and for that reason, I think they'll be OK. My only nagging doubt is they've lost Derek Adams, their manager, who got them promoted. And they've lost Jan Sungo, who's followed them to... Uh, followed Adams to Bradford and they've also lost uh, their star man Mendes Gomez who's jumped up to the championship with Luton but I just think crest of a wave type attitude will mean that Morecambe will be safe and finish 19th next portion of the table is 18th up to 13th so it could be teams that could get dragged into the mire if they suffer a loss of form or injuries or suspensions but at the same time I'm sure they've got enough quality to, to you know, frighten the so-called bigger clubs at times if they're on it and they've got everyone available. Uh, so first pick, 18th position, is a side who I really like. They play football the right way. They get it down on the deck. They pass and pass and pass, and then they pass and they pass some more. But they've lost a lot of good players from their team last season. Have they replaced it with equal quality? I'm not so sure. Mika Mandron, an ex Jules player, is their focal point in attack. I like David Artel as a manager, but I think Crew will drop down from their 12th place finish this season and finish 18th. One place above them is the final promoted team, and that is Bolton Wanderers. I like Ian Everett. He's done a very good job there. He's very bullshit. He does things his own way. Started really slow, didn't he, in League Two. But credit to the board, they stuck with him. And then he went on a magical run. I think it was 16 wins in the final 22 fixtures for the Wanderers, which saw them jump into the automatic places and finish third to come back up into League One. Um, they've bought plenty. Um, but I don't see a team coming up from League Two and going all the way through into the Championship, which has tended to happen quite a lot in recent years. So for that reason, Bolton 17th. Just above them is another team that I like. Um, they've got a really good manager. They run the right way. Their chairman's very vocal on Twitter. And, and that's Accrington Stanley. Um, John Coleman doesn't get enough credit for my liking. He's a very, very good manager. How many times has he bought in non-league diamonds and polished them up and uh, smoothed out the rough edges? You only have to look at their forward line, Colby Bishop and Dion Charles, two that you'd probably not think of, but they've been really good. The key that is that they've probably kept hold of them, and if they can keep them for the season, I think they'll be absolutely fine. Uh, but yeah, for me, Accrington Stanley finished 16th. One place above them is a team that were destined for the top two as recently as last Christmas. They've lost their best player, they've lost their manager um, and they certainly lost their way um, plummeting down the table from being automatic contenders to finish 14th at the end of last season. They've got Richie Wellens in now. They've bought pretty well, but I'm just worried that there's going to be a bit of a hangover from that really poor end to the last season. So for that reason, I've got Doncaster Rovers in 15th, in 14th. I just want to say the biggest thing for me about this team is that their manager is now fit and well and will be back on the touchline. So it's great to see Steve Cotterell being able to do his job properly again, rather than from afar. You have to remember, this is a bloke who was doing his job from his hospital bed and at home for so many months after contracting COVID, ably supported by Aaron Wilbraham, who was on the touchline on match days. Shrewsbury, outside pick of some to get into the top six. I'm not so sure they've got enough quality. I certainly don't think they'll score enough goals. I've earmarked Ryan Bowman to potentially be a player that could give them more cut and thrust in the final third. Defensively, I think they'll be all right. Steve Cotter has set them up well. Um, but will that be at the detriment of the creative influences at the other end? So for that reason, I've got Shrewsbury in 14th position. And the final team in this section is another side that were they were gone. Let's be honest, absolutely gone when Jimmy Floyd, Asselbank and Dino Marmier took over in January. Their first game in charge was against my club, Gillingham, and they turned us over 1-0 at the Priestfield in January. Went on an incredible run. 
It's been backed by his chairman, Hasselbank, in the summer. They bought in plenty of good players, the likes of Deji Osolaja, the likes of Tom O'Connor. There's so many, but unfortunately, it looks like all the attacking players that they've bought in seem to be injured, looking at um, Twitter. Lewis Malt's out for five months. I think Kane Hemmings might have picked up a, a tweak or a knock, which is going to hold them back. Will they score enough goals to really push on into the top half? I don't think so, but they'll certainly be in no trouble this season. So 13th position for me goes to Burton Albion. So we move into the top half. We're now looking at 12th up to 7th. Those teams that will think they may have an outside shot at the playoffs, but will ultimately come up short, in my opinion. 12th position might surprise a few. It's a team that came down from the championship. It's a team that traditionally yo-yos between this division and the second tier. But I can't see it happening this time around. That's Paul Warren's Rotherham. Don't think they'll be in any trouble. Um, but I just think their squad's too small at the moment. They've got good players, but they've lost their best player in Matt Crooks. He's gone to Middlesbrough, stayed in the Championship. Um, and I just think a lack of numbers at the moment could hold them back. I've just seen on Twitter today that there are reports that they should have three or four in by the first game of the season, but they may, tight, may take time to gel. Um, and I just think it'll be a season, because of this division strength, that Rotherham won't go straight back up. And I've got them in 12th position. One place above them... Probably the most surprising uh, pick um, in the whole of the table for plenty. And that is Danny and Nicky Cowley's Portsmouth. Nothing against the Cowleys. I think they're excellent managers at this level. But I just think the rebuild is a lot bigger than anyone envisaged when they first took over back in the spring. Uh, they've got rid of a lot of players and a lot of players that were very good for them. Craig McGillivray's gone to Charlton. Uh, Jack Watmore's gone to Wigan. Tom Naylor's gone to Wigan. Um... Andy Cannon was released and has gone to Hull. There's a few more experienced players that were very good for them last season on the Hull. They didn't make the top six last season. So have they improved enough? I don't think so. I think they're regressing, which is hard to say. But they might have a strong end to the transfer window and then they could suddenly become contenders. But based on what I've seen so far, there's rumours that the budget's been cut as well. They bought in a lot of loan players. They're not really spending money. I've had to put Pompey in 11th. One place above them I've already spoken about is my club, Gillingham, in 10th. So we move on to 9th, another team that got relegated out of the Championship, had a points deduction. Uh, Sheffield Wednesday, probably the most difficult to gauge at the moment, like Charlton were last season. They've got stuff hanging over their head still off the field. Uh, but they've still got good players. Barry Bannon's the absolute key for me. If he stays, then they're going to have a really cam good campaign, I feel. But there's still a chance that he might move on. Josh Windass might move on, but he's injured at the moment. So either way, that's detrimental to how they start the season. They've signed pretty solidly so far. Not great in numbers. One I do like is the lad Mide Shadipo, who was on loan at Oxford last season. Contributed, I think, around 14 goals overall um, in terms of goals and assists. So he's one to keep an eye on. And uh, at the moment, Sheffield Wednesday, I've got finishing in ninth. One place above them is a side that lost out in the playoff final last season, and that's Lincoln City. Again, Michael Appleton recently been in hospital for a procedure, but he's back working at the training ground on the touchline, so that's great to see first and foremost. But again, they lost a lot of good players from last time out, didn't they? Alex Palmer, who was brilliant in goal, has gone back to West Brom. They've lost their fullback, who's returned to Tottenham, but there is a rumour he might come back in. George Grant, 13 goals, I think about 10 from the penalty spot. You're going to have to replace them one way or the other. doesn't matter whether it's a penalty or a 30 yard. A goal's a goal. Two low knees out wide. Morgan Rogers and Brennan Johnson have both returned to Man City and Nottingham Forest, respectively. Have they replaced them in terms of equal quality? I'm not sure. I like Chris McGuire. Uh, he plays the game on the edge. He's got loads of ability. He's back with his old boss, isn't he? Uh, Michael Appleton, having spent time together at Oxford previously. But at the moment, I don't think they'll score enough goals. I don't think Tom Hopper's a 20-goal-a-season striker. So they're going to have to rely on their midfield again. And I don't think they'll get as many from that area of the pitch as they did as last season. So for that reason, I've got Lincoln City in eighth. Uh, one step further up and just missing out on the playoffs. Sorry, Sunderland fans, but you're going to spend another season in League One. They've lost all their goals from last season in terms of Charlie White. I know Sunderland fans didn't think much of him up until the last campaign, but... To lose that volume of goals is going to be hard to replace. I know Will Griggs scored in a friendly victory over Hull recently, but will he be able to turn the tap back on and get back to the levels that he's shown with Wigan and MK Dons previously in this division? It remains to be seen. We don't know how Lee Johnson's going to play. Um, he could be the type of player that thrives, but only time will tell. They've made some decent signings, but again, have they made enough? They've lost experience in Grant Ledbetter. They've lost experience in Max Power. Um, they look short in some areas. Um, certainly up top. 
I don't think they've got a natural number nine at the moment. I don't think any of the players that they've got who could play there have scored more than five or six goals last season. Luke O'Nine looks like he's going to play centre mid, but then you probably need a right back. Um, the one lad that they've got in, I think, is Callum Doyle from Man City on loan. He looks a real prospect at 17. Uh, their goalkeeper's dodgy for me, though, as well. And then you've also got this problem regarding Lee Johnson. Streaky Lee is his nickname. Last season, we were talking them up as title winners or, or automatic promotion contenders, and then they went on a run and didn't win for you know six, eight games, and it cost them, ultimately, and they lost to Lincoln in the playoffs. So for that reason, I've got Sunderland missing out and finishing seventh. On now to the upper reaches of the table, sixth up to first. And if your team's not been mentioned yet, you can start getting excited. You're going to be playoffs at worst, top two at best, if I'm correct. In sixth place, I have a team that were battling relegation last season, stayed up over the last couple of games. They've gone on a massive spree in terms of bringing in players in the summer transfer window. They've got a lot of good free transfers in, paid a fee for a couple, I think, as well. And their business looks really, really good in terms of where they were last season and where they could potentially go to this coming campaign. I think this is the standout team of the summer in terms of incomings. Ben Amos in from Charlton, Jack Watmore from Wigan, Tom Naylor from Portsmouth, um, Gwion Edwards from Ipswich, Charlie White from Sunderland, Stephen Humphreys from Rochdale. That's just to name a few off the top of my head. Liam Richardson's Wigan I've got being in the final playoff place in sixth. The only nagging doubt I have is whether Richardson can handle the pressure of being in a promotion battle rather than a relegation battle, but I think he has all the capability. So for that reason, I'm going to put Wigan Athletic in sixth. In fifth, I've got a team that I had in the top two until news broke recently that their manager, Russell Martin, has been approached by championship outfit Swansea City, and that's MK Dons. It's going to be interesting now to see how that develops. It looks for all the world like he might be moving on, which will be a real shame and a real hammer blow to the MK Dons faithful. But they've still got good players and you cannot dispute the quality and the squad that they've got at their disposal. Made some really good signings. Mo Easter, I think, is the standout. Scored eight goals in the last two seasons, in each of the last two seasons for Peterborough. But you have to remember, he's played out of position, played second fiddle to Ivan Tony and then Johnson Clark Harris. But he's a natural finisher. Scored plenty for Cheltenham, which earned him a move a few seasons back to Bristol City, where it didn't quite work out in the Championship. But I think if Issa plays all the time, he'll score you 15, 20 league goals. Scott Fraser's coming from Ipswich, another excellent addition. They've got Josh McCreckran signed a new deal. Um, Max Waters has come in from Cardiff on loan, done really well at Crawley last season. Troy Parrott's arrived on loan from Premier League Tottenham. So they've got options behind Moisa. They've got options to go as a two. They could play as a one. I know that Russell Martin likes a back three, but if he moves on, will they change the system? Still got the experience. Dean Lewington there calling all the shots as club captain. They've just got really nice looking footballers, technically good footballers all over the pitch. Like I say, it'd be interesting to see how the managerial um, situation does develop, but I'd still back MK Dons to have enough good quality to be in the playoffs. And I've got them in fifth. One place above is the final team that came down from the championship last season. Lost a couple of key players. Fred on your dimly went to the championship with Luton, I think it was. Uh, Uchia Ikpiazu went to Middlesbrough. But they seem to have been replaced. They've signed Sully Kaikar a free transfer after his release by Blackpool's promotion. And they've signed Sam Vokes from Championship Stoke. Um, Hasn't scored plenty of goals in the last few seasons, folks, but he was very good for Wales in Euro 2016. He certainly knows where the back of the net is. He provide experience. It'd be a handful for any centre-back at this level. So in terms of quality, I don't think they've lost any. They've got plenty of that squad available that done well in this Division 2 seasons ago. They've still got most of them that were available last season and gave the Championship a real go in fairness to them. And they've still got Gareth Ainsworth, who's an excellent manager at this level. So for me, Wickham Wanderers certainly going to be in the playoffs in fourth position. Top three uh, and final playoff place is completed by a side that is run by another player, another manager who's very good at this level. He knows how to get his side in the playoffs. What he needs to do now, though, is find a way to take them to the next level. I think the thing that was um, a big criticism of this side last season was their failure to take points off teams in and around them, and that's Carl Robinson's Oxford. They seem to lose a good centre-back every season, don't they? Rob Dickey before took a while to replace him, but they got Rob Atkinson in. He's now gone to Bristol City. Um, if they can get someone in to replace him, they've got an excellent squad at this level. They've got creative players. They've got solid goalkeepers. They look defensively sound. They've got Sam Long at right-back, who's a very good attacking full-back. They lost Josh Ruffles, but I think they've upgraded in Steve Seddon. He's excelled for Wimbledon and Portsmouth on loan from Birmingham in recent seasons at this level. And he's now here on a permanent at the Kassam Stadium. So I think that's an upgrade. James Henry, Matty Taylor, 
there's real good quality all over the park. And if Robinson can just find a way to eke out points against teams in and around them, then I'll back Oxford to again be in the playoffs in third position. Right, on to the top two, the automatic promotion places. Uh, second place, I've got a side. They've not made loads of additions so far this summer, but they do have a new manager. He came in at the back end of 2021. They just missed out on the playoffs and finished seventh. But considering all the off-the-field issues they had last summer, that was an excellent achievement for me. And then losing Lee Bowyer. They've got Nigel Atkins in charge. It's the Addicts, Charlton Athletic. I think they're going to be really strong this season. Um, they've signed... Craig McGillivray from Portsmouth, probably one of the best keepers at this level. Um, they've got the lad for me, for Mwino, I think it is, back in on loan from Norwich, the centre-back. Forgive me if I pronounce that wrong. Jaden Stockley apparently turned down bigger money moves to come and play for Charlton regularly. So that's a great um, attitude to have, and I think that's a really good signing. He was very good in the back end of last season. Scored against my club, Jules, when we won 3-2 at the Valley. But for pre-season, under his belt, I think he'd be very strong. They've got Ryan Innes, who's fit. They've got good players in midfield. Got experience mixed with youth, and for that reason, and the Nigel Atkins effect, he knows how to get out of this league. I've gone for Charlton Athletic as runners-up, and that leaves one club to be champions of League One come the end of the season after 46 gruelling fixtures. I said that Wigan Athletic had probably done the standout business in terms of where they were last season and where they can get to. This club's been equally active and equally impressive in the transfer market. I backed them on the third tier to gatecrash the playoffs when this manager took over last season. Made me look like a right mug. They barely scored a goal at the end of the campaign. They've certainly rectified that. They've already got James Norwood. They've added Macaulay Bon on loan. They've added Joe Piggott on a free transfer. You know what I'm talking about. It's Ipswich Town. I think their business has been brilliant. They've bought in Scott Fraser from MK Dons. They've bought in Raheem Harper, a youngster from West Brom, who was highly rated and nearly went to a Premier League club or Juventus a couple of summers ago. Be interesting to see how he gets on. They've added Steele. They've got rid of all the Deadwoods. There was plenty of ageing players that weren't doing a job for them. They've signed George Edmondson. Uh, for a fee, that looks a very astute bit of business if you can get games, ball playing, centre half. They've strengthened in the goalkeeping department. They've got the two Czech Republic keepers now. And um, again, like Nigel Atkins, they've got a boss in Paul Cook who knows how to win promotion around this level. He's done it with Chesterfield. He's done it with Portsmouth. He's done it with Wigan. And for that reason, come May, I'm back in Ipswich Town to be the champions of League One. And done. That is my Gillingham and League One season preview done and dusted, complete. Please comment down below. I'm sure everyone disagrees me with where I've put your team. I've probably put some of you too low. Most of you are going to hate me. I think it's a really competitive division. I've said on Twitter already, I think there's probably 16 teams at least that think they can get in the top half. There's probably 12 teams that think they can get in the top six. And I think by the end of the season, we're going to have a lot of disappointed fan bases. For your sake, I hope it's not your club. Primarily for my sake, I hope it's not my club. But comment down below. Let me know what you think of the predicted table. Let me know where you think my team, Gillingham, are going to finish up. Um, find us on Twitter. Find us on YouTube. Find us on Facebook. Find us on Instagram. We're only five away from 1,600 subscribers. So if you could go and hit that subscribe button, it'd be really appreciated. I'm going to try and get more fans of opposition clubs onto the channel throughout the season. So if you can subscribe, it's easier to get hold of you. Follow me on Twitter and I'll follow back. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the preview as a whole. Enjoy your weekend. And until next time, up the jewels.